I think presentations that include graphs are always awesome. Um, it's hard to overstate that. Next up is Mr. John Jenkins. I don't have graphs. You don't have, you don't have to have graphs. <laughs> I uh, can make some really fast. Um, John is going to talk about, uh, about speed, about velocity specifically, not the conference, um, but, but the concept um, and the idea of, uh, of, of what it means to iterate fast. And he's going to throw in a little bit of physics as well. Cool. Is Whatever it, is the, uh, yeah, I think it's going. Is it, uh, is it working for things? Oh, there, there we go. go. Sweet. All right. Uh, hi, my name is John Jenkins. Uh, I work at Amazon, and most recently I've been working on Amazon's new Silk browser project. Uh, later today I'll be talking about Silk in the other room, and I encourage you to come to that if you uh, like talking about browsers and performance in general. Uh, but for the next few minutes, what I wanted to talk about is sort of a higher level theme that I think is important at the Velocity Conference, uh, especially as we kick off the first Velocity Europe. Um, I've been involved in the Velocity Conferences since the very earliest days, along with Steve Souders. Uh, over that time, the conference has grown in a lot of ways. It's huge in America, it's spread to Asia, and now into Europe. Uh, and it's really helped a lot of people focus on improving web applications and web operations. Over the next few days, you're going to hear a lot of information about performance and speed. Uh, and it's true that speed matters a lot. You just saw a presentation that speed speed's really important. But uh, in many cases, there's something else that we need to think about as well. And I'd like to think that O'Reilly knew this when they created the conference originally. They didn't call it PerfCon or SpeedCon or FastCon or anything like that. They called it Velocity. And, and that's because Velocity has meaning in beyond just the simple meaning of speed. Speed is a simple scalar number. Uh, if you go back to your high school physics class, you might remember that uh, it'll tell you how fast you're going, but it doesn't tell you anything about the direction you're going. Uh, and when, the case, when we talk about speed and performance and operations, speed's really convenient. It's so easy to compare ourselves to other people. It's a really neat way to keep score, and that's, that's seductive in a way. But there is more to life than just speed. This is the Google homepage rendered in Lynx. Uh, it's really, really fast. If you want to go have a fast web experience, I encourage you to use the Lynx browser and start viewing the web. Uh, however, uh, and, and you can, in fact, you can get rid of your broadband internet connection. 9600 baud modem on a like old Compaq 186 works awesome if you want to view the web in this way. But even Google has recognized that there's more to the web than just speed, right? They take the time every day to create a really engaging graphic for their homepage. Uh, and they do this because the experience, the overall experience, matters more than just raw speed. And so although Google has to spend lots of money on graphic designers to create this logo every day, they spend probably tons of money on network bandwidth to deliver that image to users every day. And in fact, probably the most expensive thing is they take up milliseconds of people's time in order to deliver this custom graphic every day. They've made to do this because they know that there's more than just performance. And that's where velocity comes in. Velocity takes speed and adds a really important dimension. right? It adds direction. Uh, with velocity, you're not just moving, you're moving somewhere. Or maybe you're moving away from somewhere, but, but there is a direction involved with velocity. And herein lies the problem. It's easy to go really fast, but it's hard to go fast in the right direction. Uh, and I think probably one of the people who was better than anyone else at going in the right direction was Steve Jobs, and, and unfortunately he's no longer with us. But Steve seemed to have this uncanny ability to know exactly where things were headed. Or at least in my romanticized like, version of Steve, he seemed to know where things were headed, and that's frankly good enough for me. He got a lot of things right, and he created a lot of change in the world by getting these things right over and over. But I hate to break it to you, and, and if you're living under this, this illusion, like I'm sorry that I have to break your bubble, you're not Steve. Uh, I'm not Steve. I'm sure as heck not Steve. Um, I mean, maybe there's someone in the audience who's going to have the vision and foresight of Steve, but, but I'd bet against it. And the reality for people like us, or at least me, is that I get things wrong as often as I get them right. Um, and when you're a person like me, and you make a lot of mistakes, you need to learn from those mistakes, 
You need to, to soldier on and, and try and do something better the next time in light of the information you've gained in terms of making the mistake. In other words, people like us have followed paths that look a lot like this, right? It's been true for almost everything I've done over the last 15 years as a technologist. Um, I've worked on lots of projects. Some have, have had great outcomes, but the interesting thing is seldom were those outcomes the actual outcome I expected at the outset of the project. Um, in other cases, in another way of saying this is that I often end up in a good place, but the way I get there is, is not often the way I would expect. So another way to look at this, going back to our high school physics example, is, is to talk about displacement and distance. Um, if you remember high school physics, you might remember that displacement is a, a vector. It's the shortest vector between two points. Um, and basically, on this graph or chart, uh, the blue line represents displacement. And, and from my view, Steve Jobs was able to follow the displacement line pretty darn often and had great outcomes. But for the rest of us, we need to iteratively find our way to the end point. And if we do that, we have to start worrying about distance. Distance is the total, uh, total linear distance traveled uh, regardless of the shortest distance between two points. In other words, we're following this orange line, right? We double back on ourselves. We make mistakes. Um, and a lot of times, we can't even predict when these double backs are going to happen. Um, in short, we just don't take a very efficient path to get to the end result that we're trying to get to. And so this brings us back to velocity. Velocity is about moving, but it's about moving in the right direction. And since most of us can't be certain about what the right direction is, if you, you need to put yourselves in a position where you can change direction very, very quickly and reduce the cost of changing direction. If you don't believe me, uh, let me share a quick story that sort of proves this point. This guy's name is Colonel John Boyd. Uh, he was in the United States Air Force in the middle of the last century. Uh, he had a nickname in the Air Force. His nickname was 42nd Boyd, uh, and that came from the fact that he had made a bet to anyone else who, had, who, any other pilot in the Air Force, that he could start from a position of disadvantage in a dogfight, and in 40 seconds, he could put himself on the other pilot's tail in a position where he could shoot him down. And during his entire time in the Air Force, he never lost that bet. So Boyd uh, had this theory, or he had this curiosity, and his curiosity stemmed from these two planes. Uh, the plane on the left here is a United States plane. It's the F-86, and the plane on the right is a Soviet MiG-15. Uh, in the middle of the last century, these two planes did a lot of battle with each other in the skies over Asia. And there's a really interesting factor about this. The MiG on the right is a faster plane it can maneuver faster, it can climb faster, it does all kinds of things better than the F-86. But there's this curious outcome that F-86s shot down MiGs at a ratio of nine to one in air combat. So Boyd was really, really curious about this. He wanted to figure out why that happened. Um, and so what he did was he studied both planes very extensively, and what he found that there were two things about the F-86 that were different than the MiG. The first one is that in the F-86, the pilot has better view out the, oops, out the sides of the uh, aircraft. Um, the second thing is that in the F-86, it has a hydraulic control system. So while the plane can't turn faster, the pilot can initiate a turn faster. The pilot can react a little bit quicker in the F-86 than in the MiG. And so Boyd looked at this, and what he found out was that there's this concept he created called the OODA loop. Uh, for those of you that don't, haven't heard of it before, it stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. It's basically a decision-making loop. And what Boyd discovered was that it's the speed of iteration through that loop that matters. Not whether you're making the right move, but just that you're making a move and that you're making the move really, really fast. And this is really good news for people like, like me who often make wrong moves because I don't have to be Steve Jobs. I just have to, to iterate quickly and find the right solution through trial and error. A better way to maybe explain this concept is through chess. Um, I'm a pretty bad chess player, but like Boyd, I'll make audacious bets. I'm willing to bet that I can be anyone in this audience at chess if you're willing to give me one sort of condition of the game. And that condition is that I get to take two moves for every one move that you make. Um, in, <laughs> And that's basically the concept of the OODA loop explained in chess, right? By reacting faster, I don't have to be as good. I, I just get to, I get to make progress through trial and error. So 
so the question is, how should we apply these concepts to, to web performance? Well, I'll start with the web developers in the audience. You're probably going to go back to your companies after this conference. You're going to have a whole bunch of ideas, right? You're going to want to implement them all. So you'll, you'll check out a branch of code. You'll start pounding away on the keyboard. Um, and you'll implement all kinds of performance improvements. And ideally, you'll have this goal that you're going to end up at. Um, but the reality of doing something like that is that along the way, the actual goal you're trying to get to may very well shift. Or you may not have understood the goal in the beginning. You may have created the links version of your site instead of an engaging sort of graphical version of your site that engages customers. And this is a lot about how things work in the real world. A much better approach is to iterate quickly. This is the OODA loop in action for software development, right? In the case uh, that we're seeing small incremental steps, and you're ending up at the right goal instead of the wrong goal. Furthermore, as Steve said this morning, it was a perfect lead-in. Um, it's really important for people in this audience to iterate going forward because it's through iteration, incremental improvement, that we discover what works. That's how Steve figured out, or I think anyway, that's how Steve figured out the best practices. He didn't bundle in a whole bunch of improvements all at once and just hope that it worked out. He made incremental changes. He figured out what works. And the, those of you in this audience are going to be the ones who figures out what works next. The best practices will come from you. Now, let's talk about ops for just a minute as well. If you're an ops person, I claim that this is your job. Uh, I ran ops on the Amazon.com websites for, uh, for several years. And I'd like to think that the best thing I did was to think of my job as a giant undo button. Uh, we created systems at Amazon and automation that reduced or eliminated the consequences of mistakes. This increased the speed of iteration for Amazon's developers because they could sort of deploy with impunity and not worry about breaking things. Uh, this is a slide I presented at the last American Velocity Conference, and, and it had sort of an unintended effect. And, and certainly these numbers are very impressive. We deploy a lot at Amazon, thousands of deployment changes or production changes an hour, tens of thousand hosts at any one time. But I realized that after the last conference, this slide didn't really convey the right point. It's not the sheer number of deployments that's interesting at Amazon. It's the fact that we feel safe making small incremental changes all the time, and that we learn from our mistakes and improve where we're headed based on that. In short, in ops at Amazon, we've reduced the cost of making mistakes. And this is what Velocity is all about. So as you sit through the sessions at this conference today and, and you focus on, on speed, remember that there's this other part of the equation called Velocity. Uh, it's about direction. You figure out that direction by iterating. And if you take these lessons and apply them as you go back to your business, you'll feel a lot more comfortable making small mistakes. You'll enable your business to make progress even when things don't go right. And in essence, you'll be able to experience sort of the success of Steve Jobs without having to have the insight and brilliance of Steve Jobs. Thanks very much.